Awesome. Thanks again for uh, joining us, everybody. And if you're listening to the recording, thanks for, for listening in. Um, today's topic uh, is building a human firewall, strengthening security awareness for your nonprofit. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, chat with Sam a month or so ago, and um, he's just starting up this business um, and has a, a great track record in space. And I'm like, yeah, it's definitely under... Um, it's a lot of people think about it at nonprofits, but I think it's an under under kind of discussed um, the topic uh, with professionals leading those conversations. So I thought it'd be great to have Sam on and um, share his knowledge with with our our audience. Um, so um, yeah, Sam, if you want to go ahead and hit the next slide, just the normal housekeeping stuff. Um, feel free to. Uh, use chat to um, tell us where you're from or ask uh, any questions. And then also feel free to drop in the Q and a area. Uh, I'm happy to help um, uh, field any of the kind of housekeeping items. We are going to be recording this, um, recording it right now, and we'll be sharing the recording after the fact. Um, so if you need to jump off early, we won't take it personally. We totally understand, but um, thank you for joining us and without any further ado, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate the invitation to speak with you all today and excited to share some uh, tips for bolstering your security defenses. So today, I want to make it as simple as possible to understand current trends as well as quick wins to reduce your nonprofit cyber risk. And there's really no way to sugarcoat it. Scammers and attackers are constantly on the hunt for victims and are opportunistic in who they target. It's important to understand that the internet today is more like a digital war field where criminal organizations conduct their illegitimate operations with efficiency and diligence. So I get it. Many of you are probably burned out by the topic of cybersecurity. It's complicated. Uh, it's always changing and it's pretty difficult to keep up with, even for somebody like me that, that lives and breathes security. So I'll do my best to make uh, things relevant and actionable. And uh, I hope you all take away something and also that you have questions, which we'll leave uh, probably about 15 to 20 minutes for at the end. Don't think I'll be presenting for the entire hour that we have together. Uh, but with that being said, let's dive in. So here's how I wanted to organize today's uh, webinar and uh, wanted to give you a feel for what's on the agenda for today. So uh, we'll talk about you know the goals and outcomes, uh, share some general rules, tips, uh, and suggestions. And then dive into some common formulas scammers use when performing social engineering. Uh, at the end, there'll be a pretty simple live demo uh, where I'm just going to show you how easy it is to send a legitimate looking phishing email. Um, and uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll kind of talk about some current trends and things going on in the world of, of security, especially as it relates to nonprofits. So uh, with all that said, I want to kick off uh, things with uh, our first poll question which uh, is in one word, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word uh, cybersecurity? Let me pull, let me launch that here. You should be seeing that now. I can see that, thank you, Mark. Give folks a few moments to answer that and then I'll put the results up. All right, I'm gonna give it another couple seconds and then I'll end the poll and show the results. All right, there we are. Can you see those results? Uh, Let's see Sam? here. I can. I cannot actually, um, but anyways, you stop sharing that. No, I think everybody else can see it, but us. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So I'm I'm, I'm going to go ahead and assume that the answers are probably pretty varied, but they have uh, a lot to do with uh, fatigue, complexity and maybe a general sense of not really understanding where to start. Typically when I ask that question, that's uh, that, that's what I see. So, um, you know, there'll be obviously some topics that, uh, you know, are pretty straightforward, uh, but maybe some things that are a little more technical. 
Um, but I just wanted to get a feel for kind of everyone to, uh, you know, kind of share what their, you know, impressions are with uh, regard to cybersecurity. <clears throat> so the intended audience for today is really anyone, uh, which is actually, you know, just the, the point of conducting basic security awareness training for uh, any structured organization like a nonprofit. So staff with no training, uh, those simply curious, and realistically, anyone that does anything online should be able to glean something from today's webinar. Even if you're well aware of how to safely use digital communications and how to spot scammers, uh, it's important to refresh your knowledge as tactics and trends uh, obviously change quite frequently. Um, but to put it bluntly, this is why I have a job. Uh, it would be impossible to be an effective security practitioner and implementing all, all the things that are needed for organizational um, uh, cybersecurity and hold down uh, another position. Uh, security just moves uh, simply too quickly. Uh, many folks like myself don't wanna hear this, uh, but I'll go ahead and say it. And the reality is that no one does security uh, just for the sake of doing security. You all have missions, donors, uh, staff, and other business functions to attend to. And security is really a variable that is dependent on the unique circumstance of, of each nonprofit, which leads us into the most nuanced question of all, uh, what is the right level of security? And I'm gonna to touch upon this uh, more in a couple of slides. I like to call the most important part of the security stack, uh, the human layer. This is also where the, ti the title for today's webinar comes from as each person has the ability to practice discernment and uh, enact as a firewall and last layer defense against targeted uh, cybersecurity attacks. So there's a few points that I like to elaborate on when I describe the human layer. Uh, and the first is that we all come from different backgrounds and have different experiences and expectations when it comes to being cyber aware and getting educated. So as I mentioned, even for me as a subject matter expert, I had to do cyber related training and continuous education all the time. Uh, I mean, it literally never stops because technology never ceases to advance. And with those advancements comes new threats and changes in, in best practices. Uh, because email and other digital functions are necessary for today's modern workforce, uh, it's critical that everyone adheres to the same organizational security principles and guidelines. I know I'm stating the obvious here, um, but uh, in today's world, there is no avoiding the use of technology, whether it be for you know, personal use of your job. Um, uh, and so our businesses must document its standard operating procedures in order to set expectations. The third applies especially to how we educate ourselves and most importantly, training our reflexes to identify and report social engineering and phishing attempts. So put another way, consistency is important when conducting staff security awareness training. And it's imperative to establish a minimum level of competency in all staff members regarding phishing and social engineering. Uh, the last point is that we must take the initiative to honestly assess our individual security competency and tailor our educational efforts in order to improve uh, a workplace's security culture. So all of this constitutes the establishment of, uh, of a security baseline within our organization which enhances the overall security culture and effectively reduces the level of cyber related risk. So what are we aiming to achieve here today? Well, security is everyone's job, which means that everyone at your nonprofit should be informed about the risks and consequences of getting fished. Everyone should also be up to date uh, on the, uh, the state of the organization's security. In security, there's a phenomenon called ESP, and I'm not talking about, you know, something from a, a sci-fi M. Night Shyamalan movie. In, in this case, ESP stands for Efficient Security Principle. And, if, and ESP is not necessarily concerned with what's uh, morally or ethically correct. Um, when I say ESP, I'm talking about the security baseline that gets set out of efficiency. So if I'm going to give you a couple of examples, um, online stores, banks get hacked all the time. We hear about it in the news constantly. Even cell phone companies nowadays seem to be a, a pretty prime target. Yet even with all of these high profile breaches, uh, there are very few people that are actually exiting the services that, the, that these companies provide. And the question is, well, why is that? And that's because the, you know, typically these firms provide a massively valuable service. And uh, you know, there's, there's, there's the trade-off that most are willing to make. So in other words, the quality of the product or service is inversely correlated to its security baseline. And every one of the nonprofits represented here today uh, has a security baseline. 
So the question isn't what's the right level of security, it's at what point should we set our security baseline to ensure adequate protection without jeopardizing support for our mission? Um, and it's you know not something that's quick to uh, arrive uh, on answering, but there are some steps that need to take place after uh, we can have that conversation. And the first is to make sure that the, the baseline is actually where it is believed to be. So are there security gaps that the organization or its users don't know about? And if so, how do we make those visible to, the, uh, to close the knowledge gap and find technical help? The second is to be creative and attempt to discover ways to uh, raise the security baseline in a manner that doesn't inconvenience your nonprofit or its primary mission. So leaders may not wanna spend extra money or effort to raise a baseline, but no one is gonna object or argue uh, to it if they don't have to lift a finger and the security baseline can be increased. I believe if we're gonna have an honest conversation about security, um, that everything needs to be able to start with an honest assessment of our individual levels of competence. So these levels apply really to anything in life um, and can be worded differently. So uh, maybe you'll find it helpful to state the level that you're at out loud so that you understand where you are. I'm willing to bet that no one uh, here uh, in attendance is at level one since you've all taken the initiative to attend today's webinar. Most of the nonprofits that I work with uh, are somewhere between level two and three. And there are even some folks at these organizations that are at level four, but that doesn't mean that they stop their education. Uh, instead, these folks are constantly refining their knowledge uh, and hit the update button regularly because, like I said, technology continues its relentless march forward. So let's put things succinctly then. The ultimate objective, uh, once we understand our own individual level of competence, uh, is to cultivate fresh habits by provisioning alternative actions, not just eliminating behavior patterns, um, and to adopt a mindset of deleting potentially uh, concerning emails as a new behavior. So if anyone has you know, gone on LinkedIn lately, I'm sure you've seen all of these habits or systems gurus, and a lot of them are saying pretty much the same thing, right? Replace your habits, don't eliminate them. Um, and behavioral psychology also tells us that it's more manageable to substitute one behavior for another. So when we talk about security awareness training and building the human firewall, uh, that's really you know, what we're focusing in on. We'll talk about some general rules now, but um, really I hate the term rules. So I like to call them guidelines. Um, you know, there's just a few short and sweet, three quick and immediate actions uh, that I like to highlight at this point. So the first is never to take anything for granted. Anytime you receive a request that might seem anomalous, such as downloading an attachment, clicking on a link, we need to be a bit skeptical unless we're absolutely certain uh, that it is legitimate. I'm not saying that, you know, you need to put on your tinfoil hat um, and, and, uh, you know, try and, uh, 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 you know, like ensure that every single request that someone is asking of you is in fact legitimate. Um, but taking that tactical pause in assessing the situation and confirming with the source of the request can squash attempted social, social engineering attempts uh, rather quickly. These unfortunately are going to continue to get uh, more sophisticated and more believable as we're entering, you know, the, the uh, new tech, new territory and technology as AI becomes more and more present in our, uh, in our day-to-day -day workflows. So uh, the only thing that's going to slow this down is sound situational awareness and decision-making from your staff. Uh, second, we have to avoid reusing passwords uh, and enforce MFA. This seems pretty straightforward, um, but we, we need to get into the mind of an attacker for a second if we're going to, you know, kind of understand like, you know, how they're actually able to, uh, you know, compromise users by, uh, you know, compromising just like a, a, a data source. So let's say you have a login at a trivial website, such as a blog or some other place, uh, and you've since forgotten about it. Over time, the security of this service is neglected uh, and information such as usernames and passwords are compromised uh, by a threat actor. Let's also assume that the, the attacker is able to, um, uh, to identify specific users that they have compromised. Well, the first thing that they're going to do is look for another service that you are using, such as a bank or a social media site, or potentially find out where you work. 
And now with those credentials uh, that they've obtained, they will try and use that on all accessible authentication systems. And it's oftentimes a pretty easy win uh, because it's common for people to reuse the same passwords across multiple services because it's easy to remember. Uh, we have to get out of this habit and use a password manager and uh, and use some unique complex passwords that have a little bit of length to them. The last point is pretty obvious as well, um, but you know, uh, want to just reinforce the the importance of it, and that's to limit the amount of information that you post publicly. Um, the first step in anyone targeting your nonprofit is to perform what we call open source intelligence gathering. And this is where the threat actors will essentially build a profile on your staff and organization using publicly available information. Now, some of that information out there is unavoidable. Our information is everywhere and it, it oftentimes lives on the internet without our consent. But we frequently volunteer other information that can seem harmless, but in fact can be valuable for this type of espionage. And you know, an example of this may be the times that you put up a picture of your dogs, children, or in, inadvertently shown the address uh, of your house that everyone cannot see. Well, this makes it very easy for threat actors to begin formulating educated password guessing or impersonating you without your knowledge. So we wanna try and limit that where possible. So speaking of multi-factor authentication, I want to uh, do our second poll question. And that is how effective is multi-factor authentication in reducing um, the risk of compromise and deterring cyber attacks? All right, that one is up there now and folks are responding. Leave it up there for a little bit longer, give everybody a chance to respond to the poll question. And I will end it here in just a moment as I see most people have responded. Looks like most of you uh, selected 85.4%. Uh, which is close, uh, but the correct answer actually is 99.2%. Uh, and this comes from Microsoft Digital Defense Report of uh, 2023. So MFA is really becoming the bare minimum now, but there's a balance that we need to strike here because if we as an organization begin to implement multi-factor authentication on everything, it can cause fatigue with users who will then be more likely to try and turn off these security features, especially if uh, there is no enforcement. There's multiple ways that MFA can be implemented. I'm sure many of you have seen them. Um, you know, it could be something like a security question on the authentication system itself, which is the least secure, uh, but adds another layer of complexity, right? An example of that, you know, one that we've all probably seen is like, what, what's your mother's maiden name, right? Or some other question like that. Another uh, type of MFA is, is an MSS-based pin that is texted to your mobile phone. Um, but the best or better implementation is, uh, you know, we'll typically ask that you configure an authenticator app such as Google, Microsoft Authenticator, uh, or Duo, which are, you know, pretty easy to implement and, and give you that out of band communication for receiving a token. The gold standard for MFA though, which is considered to be, you know, fish resistant is to implement uh, hardware tokens such as UV keys. And these are those small looking devices that resemble flash drives that are physically plugged into your computer. They're, they're a bit more expensive, as I said, and difficult to implement, but can have a tremendous benefit in uh, providing good security and peace of mind. And oftentimes they also require some form of biometric data, like a fingerprint to obtain uh, the code or login. So, you know, if we're striving for that highest, you know, implementation or, or best implementation, uh, getting a hardware uh, uh, token is, is definitely, like I said, the gold standard. All right, let's go over the three main ways that scammers operate today. And we'll, we'll uh, kick off another poll question. And that is, what is the term for phishing over voice communication? All right, we've started that poll. Give folks another moment to answer that one. No one's for, falling for the smishing. All right, fair enough. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and end this one and show the results. Okay. Great. So uh, looks like most of you got it correct. The term that uh, uh, is for phishing over voice communication is actually called vishing. 
Um, phishing and sending bulk emails that typically include malware, preparing to phone home. We've all received those. Uh, you know, if we look at our spam box, I'm sure there's, you know, multiple uh, in, in each of our inboxes. Um, spear phishing is a little bit different, and that's um, targeted phishing of someone like an owner or executive with someone that typically has like access to finance or sensitive information. Um, so in the next slide, I'm going to show, uh, you know, all three of these attacks, um, how they're in intended to create urgency and tie it to a convincing, um, uh, you know, action to take on your behalf. Um, it's more like a templated format that's, uh, you know, pretty common. It's used by criminals around the world. So with phishing and vishing, here's the typical uh, kind of playbook, if you will. So the first step involves establishing communication through email, phone call, or text message. Uh, scammers will often impersonate somebody asking for help. Uh, second, they will try to build trust and psychologically manipulate a target through some form of impersonation. Uh, in the military, we actually call this psychological operations, and that's when you try and deceive the target. Um, next, they, they create some urgency and sympathy with the target. Um, but when I say urgency, I'm not talking about like the buy it now, you know, 90s infomercial Billy Mays, like screaming from the top of of their lungs, it's it's more of like uh, you know an urgency, but not you know that that sweet spot um, to invoke some sort of emotion on the target, right? Um, the fourth part is you know the climax of the story essentially, and this is convincing the target to perform that action, like opening an attachment, clicking a link, or you know some other goal. And that action is then what runs the malware, has the uh, target share credentials. Uh, approve a wire transfer um, or whatever the, the goal of the attacker is. Um, and five is the, the point of no return. That's where, you know, we just need to hope that we have good defense in depth in place. Like if malware is, is executed on the system, if sensitive information is divulged or like I said, wire information is changed. Um, but, you know, in the end, as we can see and looking back at the course of actions that took place, um, everything is artificial. Uh, and it's not very Hollywood worthy. It's actually pretty simple. Um, and this is where I like to, you know, share like some personal anecdotes uh, as well from my career as a penetration tester or security tester. Um, and I know several very good penetration testers here in Austin. Um, and one uh, one woman that I know who's extremely good at the social engineering side of things, um, she actually was telling me the story one time about a, a large national bank that uh, she was able to hack into through social engineering. And what she did was she called the front desk uh, and basically impersonated someone on the phone and was trying to get her password reset. And in the background, she played the noise uh, of, a, of a crying baby. You know, you can Google this, find, find a video of a, a loop of a crying baby on YouTube um, and, you know, configure some sort of prop like that. And what this did for the person on the other end was it caused a large amount of stress for the person. Um, and they felt rushed and they ignored their policies and they provided her with, uh, you know, the password reset and essentially, you know, the information that she needed to log in um, because they felt uh, some sympathy for her too, because she was explaining that the baby uh, baby sound in the background was her son that hadn't, you know, eaten in, uh, you know, a few hours and that she was locked out of her account and that she needs to get back in, unlock her debit card to go then be able to buy food. So. You know, the lesson here, right, is to slow down and think. And it's always easier said than done when we're removed from that situation. But uh, I like sharing that because uh, those kind of things happen all the time for real um, on, you know, people from all different backgrounds. Uh, so we just need to kind of, like I said, take that tactical pause and try to understand what's going on here and never deviate from our established uh, policies and procedures. For spear phishing, uh, things can be a bit different. Um, and this is a typical scenario of, of, you know, what I've seen for spear phishing attacks in my career. So uh, the first step typically involves a scammer locating an executive um, and then targeting an assistant. So instead of the attacker sending email to all employees, uh, the scammer identifies the decision maker within the organization and begins to attempt that compromise. So it's much more than just you know, sending an automated phishing campaign out to a huge list of, um, of uh, procured email addresses. <laughs> In the next step, the role playing uh, really begins to pick up. Uh, and that's where the scammer impersonates the executive uh, and makes requests such as a purchase uh, to be made or financial information be uh, to be changed 
on an invoice, for example, that goes to the assistant. So we've actually seen a lot of cases uh, or I've seen a lot of cases in my career where the employees try to do the right thing. Uh, they ask for a phone call or for a meeting, uh, but because the attacker is impersonating somebody in a position of authority, um, the executive often uh, defers these requests uh, because they say that they're making an exception to the rule or that they're simply in a bunch of meetings and that they can't you know, hop on a call or meeting. Um, and you know, like I said, this is where the the scammer uh, effectively deflects any of these requests for direct contact. Um, you know, knowing that that would thwart the whole uh, operation. So, lastly, once again, the point of no return: the scammer is successful in convincing a target to take a requested action. Um, and this is where we just have to hope and pray that if, if things have gotten to this point, that your nonprofit uh, or organization has good defense and depth in place. Um, so, the conclusion here is not to say that you know executive assistants are the Achilles' heel. It's just once again to demonstrate the the very common formula uh, for uh, being successful in social engineering attacks by uh, today's scammers. And I like to call these types of scenarios wolves uh, versus sheep. So we're a complicated species. We're emotional beings, uh, and we are each unique in how we perceive the world. No two people are obvious, obviously the same. And scammers know that, um, and they know that uh, humans and untrained users are the weakest link in any organization's security. So security controls can only help so much. Um, and the best way that I like to put it is technology evolves quickly, but human emotion does not. Cyber-related incidents are going to occur. And, uh, you know, to paraphrase the, the, the boxer, Mike Tyson, we need to have a plan in place even after we get, you know, punched in the mouth. Uh, just because your nonprofit has antivirus uh, and spam filtering, doesn't mean it's 100% protected. We have to be careful in what we access uh, at all times, what we download, and be mindful of what attachments we receive. And if you see some strange behavior on your machine, then there has to be you know, uh, a contact initiated immediately. Um, if anyone watched 60 Minutes this last Sunday, there was actually an excellent piece on the ransomware gangs that hacked MGM and the other Las Vegas casinos. And they got in through social engineering um, they impersonated the user, they called the help desk, and once again, they got someone to reset a password, you know, similar to the story I was sharing about, uh, you know, my, my colleague who's a penetration tester. And once they got into MGM's networks, they sat there patiently, they maneuvered, um, and they, you know, did reconnaissance on the corporate network, and then ultimately, they deployed the ransomware. So... A large enterprise like MGM um, can absorb the consequences of a successful phishing attack. MGM is still in business. Yes, they lost money, but uh, small uh, businesses and nonprofits can be completely wiped out uh, by a successful attack attack of this nature. So this last point is super important to uh, you know always keep in mind, especially when you begin to suspect that maybe you're the, you are the attempted victim of a social engineering campaign. All right, we'll talk now about some tips and suggestions. Um, and, um, you know, these are really priorities uh, to supplement the guidelines that we went over earlier. So, you know, I really wanted to kind of hammer in some points on passwords. And I know we all hear enough about passwords. We have to vary our password usage and make them long, as I stated before. Um, but really using a passphrase uh, can be an easy way to create long and hard to guess passwords. Um, an example of this could be something like, you know, I go out every Monday to eat ice cream with my son, all one word, and that's your login. Very easy to remember. Maybe take a little bit longer to type out, but I guarantee you're not going to forget it. Um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, recommends password complexity with, with eight character password. Um, you know, in addition to passphrases, as I'm demonstrating, or, or as, I'm, uh, as I'm describing. Uh, but for me personally, I don't go below 12 characters, and I try to always use passphrases. Um, and I leverage um, password managers like, uh, you know, password vaults like LastPass or OnePass to securely store, um, you know, my passwords for all the various logins I have, which, you know, at this point's nearing probably a few hundred, <laughs> um, you know, and I'm sure we're all in, in a very similar situation with the amount of times we're asked to create logins for the various services that we, we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So... Don't write your password down on a piece of paper and don't stick it under your keyboard. Um, think of you know good passphrases, make them varied, and implement some form of a, a password vault that uh, you know makes it super easy to just auto-populate and fill uh, your login when visiting the appropriate site. 
Um, so for authentication protections, we've already talked a little bit about MFA for stronger authentication. Um, and I want to emphasize once again, this doesn't need to be implemented everywhere because we don't want to cause too much friction in users uh, that you know could potentially get burned up by security. But it is absolutely essential to enable this where your most sensitive information lives. There should also be some type of notification that gets sent to an administrator every time someone logs into their account or there's a failed password attempt on these, uh, you know, on these sensitive logins. And I like to think of this as like your ring camera system. So, you know, a lot of us have these smart doorbells installed and we want to know when someone is at the front door knocking and who's coming in and out of the house. The same analogy, you know, like I said about your Microsoft or your Google logins where, you know, people access corporate assets. Um, it's super important nowadays to, like I said, get some monitoring on that and make sure that someone's being alerting at the appropriate time. <clears throat> Email is inherently insecure. Um, and so I want to emphasize that, you know, it shouldn't be used as your file and storage place. Save sensitive attachments elsewhere and, and you know, try to clean out your folders. I get it. This is, you know, uh, something very tedious and, and I'm not the best at doing this either. Um, but we have to have a process in place we were reminded, you know, on a on a specific cadence to go through and literally clean out everything that's accumulated over the course of our, you know, tenure at our organization, uh, because it can accumulate a lot of sensitive information, like you know, banking documents, um, anything that you've sent with your HR department, um, whatnot. Those can obviously be a treasure trove for anyone that's compromised, you know, user account and then has access to that person's inbox. Um, the other thing about email is that we don't want to use it for, you know, communications that are going to be um, transferring sensitive information, like, you know, validating something or whatnot. We want to stick to out of band communications, like a phone call for completing requests. You would never want to get a request for, you know, the example that I keep coming back to uh, changing information on a wire transfer and then confirm that through email. We need to pick a different medium to validate that that request is actually legitimate. Um, because it's very unlikely that, you know, the attacker is going to have the email inbox as well as a, you know, a, a SIM swap, phone compromise, um, and something a little more tech, technically savvy, um, you know, to make it full circle. So there's a lot of different ways to go about that. Um, but, you know, just wanted to hit upon that point because it's so important and can be pretty effective in, in thwarting these types of uh, social engineering attacks. The last point about email is we have to review our email inboxes uh, frequently. A lot of the business email compromises that I've seen in my career um, involved user inboxes that had no idea that someone was, was actively in their inbox and sending emails on their behalf. And how they're able to do that is after they compromise a user, they will configure inbox rules to place messages from high value targets, either in spam or other uh, folders in the, in, the, in, in the email tenant so that the person doesn't see the conversation happening behind the scenes. So this isn't a daily checklist item, but it's it's definitely good practice to go you know through on a, a monthly, weekly, whatever makes sense, and just see if there's any inbox rules that have been set up. You know, we have to assume um, that in today's climate that everything is compromised, right? And I'm not advocating for paranoia here, but that type of vigilance is needed to be effective in implementing good defenses against, you know, the types of sophisticated attacks that occur on a pretty regular basis uh, around the world. The last priority uh, relates to systems. So it's impossible to make your systems 100% secure. Once again, not advocating for paranoia here, but um, you know how that would be possible? I would ask you to wrap a chain around your laptop and throw it in the bottom of the ocean. That's how you make something 100% secure that's connected to the internet. So there's an old saying in security that if you're batting a thousand at security, you're probably broke. Security is expensive and it's very time consuming. So, you know, this goes back to the efficient security principle that we talked about uh, at the beginning of the webinar. We don't need to spend a lot of money to make our organizations more secure and withstand, you know, some of the more common attacks today. But for sensitive servers and data, we have to make sure that we have good backups um, stored separately and that there's a regular cadence for, uh, for reviewing its quality. We have to also keep these assets up to date um, and have a process for regular patch management if possible. Um, and with that, you know, implementing some sort of remote wipe capabilities, which both Windows and Mac offer, 
um, in the event of a device being lost or stolen. And that leads into a pretty important point, which is about uh, mobile devices. So mobile devices are, are ubiquitous. Everyone uh, at this point has their email on their um, on their phone. I'm assuming, um, you know, if not, then you know it's typically uh, some form of I don't know government agency or uh, higher up tech company that's able to actually provide you with phones. But a lot of us just have that configured, you know, a work email configured right on our phone. So we we have a company asset on our personal phone, meaning that we have to understand how to secure it, right? And that means don't letting other people use it, keeping track of it. Uh, if you lose or misplace it, to let your superior IT department know so that they can deal with it and the sessions that that are that are active on your device. Um, and then protecting it, right, with some form of password, um, you know, or biometric data, you know, which, which is uh, able for all of us to be implemented using, you know, any of the Android or iPhone nowadays. Um, and then up keeping it updated regularly, which, you know, if we go and update our apps and our phone, uh, we can see that almost 100% of the time when the update comes out, it, it talks about, you know, bug fixes and improvements. Uh, but in the fine print, there's also typically some listings about the security fixes that uh, are part of the update. So we have to, uh, like I said, make sure that we're creating the habit of, of keeping our devices, especially our mobile devices, uh, up to date. All right, this is our last uh, poll question, I believe. And uh, I wanted to ask uh, you all uh, what the percentage of email you think was identified as spam uh, in 2023? And while folks are ask, uh, answering that uh, poll question, uh, there was a question that came in. Um, you know, can you speak a little bit more to why you say email is inherently insecure? I think you kind of touched on a few points, but anything else to add that? Yeah, so email is inherently uh, insecure, as I mentioned, because we tend to use it as like a file storage server, which is not the intended, um, you know, uh, usage for it. The other part of that is that, um, you know, the way that enterprise email systems are managed, um, there's typically not a lot of logging and monitoring on them. And so in the event of a user, you know, actually getting their credentials compromised, um, there's oftentimes not visibility into where those accounts are being logged in from around the world. And so, you know, there's a lot of different ways that I could answer that question, but it typically comes down to just the fact that there's not a lot of visibility being put on uh, enterprise email systems, especially smaller businesses or nonprofits that don't have the resources. And it's, it's the mouthpiece through which all corporate and, and organizational communication goes through. So it's a massive target. And we have to be aware that, you know, that that's kind of the holy grail, if you will, for, you know, getting the initial foothold in the organization. Um, you know, there's lots of ways that, to, that you can go online and, and see how MFA is being thwarted. Um, you know, I know we've talked a lot about it and how it can help augment security, um, but there are more sophisticated attack groups out there that can bypass that. And the first thing we're going to do is go after the email. So um, I, kind of that's kind Kind of a long-winded answer um, and to be happy to you know share resources and, and talk more about it at the end of the webinar but um, those are just a few of the things that, that you know really come to mind for me when when i say email is inherently insecure awesome and there's the poll results poll results okay so it looks like most of you uh pretty close between 46 and 70 percent um in 2023 nearly 46 percent of all emails worldwide were identified as spam so that's actually down from uh 48 percent in 2022 but regardless um it's hard to believe that almost half of email now uh, is spam um, and one of the reasons that this has become such a problem is because the payouts and incentives are so large from phishing that there are literally thousands of criminal groups attempting to compromise staff through email so I mentioned ransomware uh, a little bit in some of the previous slides when I was talking about the MGM in Las Vegas attacks. Um, and, uh, you know, ransomware is, uh, phishing and social engineering are the first steps in, in ransomware campaigns usually. So what is ransomware though? Well, ransomware is just a form of malware that uses nefarious encryption. And when ransomware is deployed, it encrypts entire systems and networks um, when, uh, you know, when it's deployed. And it's really effective uh, when it comes to, you know, extortion. And uh, the problem seems to be getting worse and worse every year. 
So one ransomware attack can generate as much revenue in minutes as hundreds of individual ID theft attempts over months or years. Um, and as I said, a large portion of ransom uh, today's ransomware attacks begin with uh, successful social en social engineering and phishing uh, campaigns. And the interesting part about ransomware, especially these types of organizations, is that um, they actually operate as like cohesive organizations that have managers, HR departments, payroll, recruiting, and an actual structure to it. And they operate with, you know, a level of sophistication that uh, actually, you know, allows for little attribution because they're so good at being able to obfuscate uh, their origins and identity. This doesn't mean that intelligence uh, organizations don't have a good idea of who's attacking, uh, who, you know, who's responsible for all of these attacks. It just means that, you know, they're obviously conducting these at a very large scale and only a very small percentage of the time uh, are there is there able to be positive attribution to actually identify the individuals and groups that, that's involved in, um, you know, conducting these types of attacks. So ransomware actually got a bit personal for me that earlier this year uh, because of an attack that happened on a hospital system in my hometown. And uh, ironically, the hospital system was a nonprofit um, and they were spread across three states and the attackers were able to deploy ransomware and basically hit you know, I think it was 85, 90% of all of the uh, the locations and actually shut down critical medical services. And uh, once they did that, they initially demanded just sort of a billion dollars to return the systems. I don't remember what the actual, uh, you know, final uh, extortion request was. It was, just, it was a little bit less than that. Um, but, but I want to drive home the point here that the ransomware is so, like I said, pervasive and ubiquitous now and so effective that it can literally shut down um, you know, critical uh, critical care services and hospitals. And this particular hospital from my hometown literally had to divert, you know, inpatient care and other critical surgeries to, you know, surrounding uh, surrounding hospitals because they weren't able to use anything that, that uh, you know, needed some sort of communication uh, that was, you know, tied into their greater systems. I mean, it literally uh, shut down the entire hospital system for, I think about five days before they're able to stand up, um, you know, some, some of their information yeah, from, from backup. So that, that's why we're lingering a little bit about, about that. I always like to show this slide uh, as another way to drive home some points. Uh, one, because I'm a huge fan of Batman, uh, but also because for the pictures on the right, uh, I'm showing, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, heat overlay and satellite image of forward operating bases from Afghanistan. So I'll talk about it in a second, but first, you know, let's look at the, the picture of Batman here. So once again, technology changes quickly, but people don't. And through social engineering or user error, it's, uh, you know, it's the most efficient way for someone to get access to, to corporate assets. They're exploiting the human factor, right? And in the same way that Batman is chastising Robin in this picture, uh, we got to be mindful of what we're putting out there because hackers and threat actors love intelligence gathering. And that's what they're doing before they even send an email or packet is building that profile. The pictures on the right of the uh, um, forward operating bases in Afghanistan um, actually occurred uh, when I was a soldier in the army uh, and on deployment. So what, what we're looking at here is, like I said, the satellite imagery and then the, the heat overlay um, that was created because soldiers were using the Strava app to map their runs um, while they were while they were on this particular base, and over time, this information was publicly accessible, and it created this you know sort of outline of the of the base. And once this got attention of the DoD, they obviously weren't too happy. And I remember having to you know actually prove that I wasn't using any sort of fitness wearable uh, at 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 one point to my chain of command while on base. So. Um, you know, it just goes to show you once again that there's information that's, um, you know, very valuable that's oftentimes, um, you know, not intentionally put out there uh, for um, uh, for people to glean. So I'm going to skip ahead now and uh, go to uh, a slide that I like to address some things that, um, you know, some of you that are in attendance that are leaders uh, might be curious to understand how to steer the ship towards creating a better security culture. Uh, at your nonprofit. So the first step is always in creating and maintaining sound policies and procedures. There are tons of different policies, some important ones that, uh, you know, should be spelled out or training requirements 
and acceptable use of the of your nonprofit's equipment and software. There are many, many others, of course, but these are you know a, a few of them that I really like to to hit upon, you know, during that initial conversation about uh, creating more robust uh, security posture. So. I'm also a fan of using incentives um, where it makes sense. And, uh, you know, this is like human psychology 101 going back to the book Freakonomics. So people respond to incentives. And as leaders finding a way to tie, you know, incentives to um, uh, to the completion of security awareness training within an organization can be a really effective way to make sure that everyone, you know, obtains that baseline level of knowledge. So each organization, nonprofit has different financial means and ways of providing these incentives. But I, I absolutely implore, you know, those in leadership to explore ways that they can actually uh, create those within their, uh, within their company. Uh, secondly, for communications, there has to be an established reporting process uh, for your staff when they are fished or when they have identified a phishing email. So the norm should not be that it is swept, you know, under the rug and quickly forgotten about. Um, you know, the question that I was asked is, does our staff really know how to report these issues? And if not, it's probably a good idea to think about creating a policy or memo that outlines the appropriate steps. Um, the other part of communications is, you know, making sure that you have a good list of uh, like an aggregated list of third parties um, that your staff can see, uh, you know, who's approved and, and what's not on the list. So this can help avoid users from going out and procuring their own solutions to things and, and, and things that might be insecure. And actually help them help inform them of who they should be receiving communications from and what might just be a phishing attempt. And you know, kind of the um, like uh, an ancillary benefit of this too is that it can actually help reduce financial bloat if you have an organization that doesn't have these policies. You oftentimes might have redundant software where you know uh, two leaders, two department heads have gone out and procured very similar software solutions that actually have the same function. So you know, that's just like I said, an added benefit that can help here uh, if you you know, if your organization has quite a few tools and maybe they, they want to try to pare things down a little bit. Um, and the last part of communication is uh, understanding how company updates are being provided regarding security and expectations. So it's never safe to understand or make assumptions um, regarding, you know, the, the flow of information. And, you know, this is obviously how misunderstandings can quickly arise. Um, but having, you know, regular company updates also can assist in demonstrating, you know, just greater accountability within the organization um, and making things more visible and, instead of leaving it up to the telephone game. <clears throat> With planning, as I said earlier, um, your nonprofit will, in fact, endure, uh, you know, during the course of its life, some form of cyber related incident. Now, I'm not guaranteeing any, any level of severity here, but I can guarantee that you know, there's going to be something that comes up related to cybersecurity uh, during the course of, you know, your organization's lifetime. It, it, I see it all the time with organizations that are a few months old to, you know, have a couple of decades under their belt. Um, but when these types of events occur, are we understanding who's responsible for the incident response process? And do, do, does that person even know that they're responsible? Um, and that has to be rehearsed in good times and understood then, because, Post event is when stress and, and emotions are out of balance and no one's making you know good decisions. So making sure that we have sort of that dress rehearsal before, you know, as we say, uh, you know, stuff hits the fan um, is going to position us way better to actually respond appropriately to those uh, uh, those circumstances. So that ties in uh, as well to creating an organizational chart, right? Which maybe your nonprofit size doesn't necessitate it, but I still believe that it's a good idea for, you know, every organization to at least have all the names of their staff aggregated in their roles and responsibilities, uh, especially if there's some function that they can perform from a cybersecurity perspective um, and have that able to be referenced in the event of an incident. So I'm an old football player. I played played play football most of my life. And I like to think of these as, you know, like putting together a roster depth chart. Um, you want to have that, you know, readily available in case something goes down or, you know, when you're trying to, you know, go to plan B for some incident. Uh, last point on the slide is just, uh, you know, a little bit about training, you know, security awareness training. And that's obviously sort of what we're doing here today. Um, but I want to emphasize that it cannot be just a one-time event that occurred several years ago for your nonprofit. It should take place on a regular continuous basis, and it also should be varied uh, so users don't become bored and that there's, you know, fresh content that's addressing the latest risks. Uh, it should also be tailored specifically to your staff 
um, you know, and acknowledge threats that your nonprofit specifically faces. So, um, you know, your leadership should have a, a pretty good hand in creating and crafting what information is presented during that training because they know the organization better than anyone. All right, so we're in the home stretch here. Um, and I know I said I would leave a few minutes for questions. I want to make sure that uh, I'm, I uh, stand good on that promise. But uh, first, I just kind of wanted to show everybody uh, how easy it is just to send a phishing email. And we're not going to compromise anyone's credentials here. Um, we're not going to be, you know, like doing anything too sophisticated. I'm just trying to give a general idea, right, for how easy it is to, to do something like that today. So uh, we're going to forge a sender. We're going to make the legitimate, we're going to make the email look legitimate. Uh, we're going to create just a little bit of urgency. And then we're going to re redirect the user to, you know, the Office 365 login page, which, like I said, I haven't stood up any sort of infrastructure that um, is, you know, trying to impersonate that. But all I would need to do is insert the hyperlink into the email. And I would be very, it would be very easy to get somebody to, um, you know, click on that link and they go to the site uh, and, and log in. So I've spun up, uh, you know, a, uh, a dummy email here at uh, Proton Mail, And like I said, I don't use this for anything, just for demo purposes. Um, but the email address is can't stop us now at protonmail.com, which I'll, uh, you know, it's not really important to remember, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you where that comes in here in a second. Um, and <clears throat> the software that I'm talking about using is, uh, is called GoFish. And this is used by both white and black hat hackers, white hackers being, uh, you know, folks like myself that do penetration testing uh, and black hat hackers being, you know, the ones that we've been talking about during this whole presentation that are actually interested in uh, creating some sort of damage to your organization. Um, but the first thing that uh, I wanted to show you here is, um, you know, that the, uh, the first step is to create some sort of user group that uh, is going to contain all of the emails that an attacker procures that's going to uh, you know receive the email. So for today's demonstration, I just put the uh, email address tied to the Proton Mail account that I uh, that I just showed you. And uh, you know, at this point, some of you might be actually asking yourself, well, how do these you know how do attackers get these these emails, and how do they know who to send them to? There's a lot of different ways. Uh, there's dark web data breaches. There's open source intelligence gathering, as I alluded to, you know, at several points during uh, earlier slides, but. This is a tool that I use that's publicly available to anyone. Um, and I just wanna show you once again, how easy it is to get this stuff. So, um, you know, a software that I'm sure many of you uh, use, let's see, Blackboard um, is, you know, on here and there's tons of email addresses that I could, you know, try and fish immediately. So it's very trivial to get legitimate uh, email addresses or just create a list. And some of these are probably stale, um, but if I'm not worried about, you know, shooting with 100% accuracy here, I can easily create a phishing campaign and send it to literally thousands of emails simultaneously. So going back to our GoFish um, uh, dashboard here, I created a, uh, a, you know, a SharePoint access um, email and I'm going to envelop the sender with Mark's email address. So I'm impersonating Mark here. And I created uh, some you know, HTML and when rendered, it looks you know, just something like this. So it's not too flashy. Uh, it's not too, you know, uh, I'm sure some of you would be able to spot this, uh, but for a lot of us in a situation where maybe we're a new employee and we're expecting to get set up on some type of uh, you know, tool, um, maybe this is just something that you brush over and you click the link on. So, um, you know, the text is, is very easy. Hey, Sam, here's the link to access the SharePoint site. Please log in at your earliest convenience. Thanks, MB. All right, so now we're gonna send the actual campaign. And what I'll do here is just name the campaign. I'll select the landing page um, and I'll select the group, which includes that uh, Proton account email that I, uh, that I was showing you. So we'll launch the campaign and we'll wait a couple seconds for that to get to the Proton Mail account. But as you can see here in the meantime, uh, I have a dashboard complete with metrics uh, to share, you know, to show like when the emails were sent, who opened them, who clicked the link, who submitted data. 
Um, and this is this is something that any of you can pull off of GitHub or any other uh, website that that you know you can download the actual executable program from. Uh, it's not paid for. Like I said, it's completely free. So if I reload my inbox, look, I've got an email from um, from Mark. It says SharePoint access. And as you're going to see here before I open it up, there's going to be a warning because I haven't authenticated um, the domain because I just spun it up, you know, a few days ago. But um, it's not a bad looking email and you could you could easily kind of put yourself in somebody that might be new to the company that uh, isn't necessarily educated on the latest trends and tactics or uh, phishing techniques and knows that they might be getting something from from leadership and simply clicks on the link. So. You know, that link can take them anywhere. As I said, it takes them to a Microsoft login page, um, but this can easily be replicated to look identical and, um, you know, can actually be 100% illegitimate and just there to capture somebody's credentials. So, um, like I said, it, it's pretty trivial and there's not a lot of sophistication behind these actual social engineering campaigns. Okay, so in the home stretch here now. And I wanted to just switch gears and talk about um, some current data and trends. So, um, you know, this is a fairly up-to-date chart that demonstrates the countries targeted most by ransomware. USA, yep, we're number one. So, you know, many of these groups that uh, deploy ransomware operate with impunity out of Russia and former Soviet bloc countries. So within Russia, their, their government, um, they know about the existence and the extent of all the criminal organizations that operate within their, within their boundaries. And there's essentially an agreement in place where the Russian spy apparatus, you know, makes contact with these leaders uh, of these gangs and says something along the lines of, hey, we know you're here. We know what you're up to. We'll leave you alone. So continue to do what you're doing because it's in our interest. But we expect a portion of your profits. That's kind of the the environment going on right now uh, within you know Russia and like I said Eastern European countries. So it, it's pretty nasty, right? There's sort of this relationship between the criminal underground and you know a world government or a, a, a government that operates on the world stage. Um, and the reason that, that they're so keen to let these attacks continue is because small, medium sized businesses um, are commonly the target, and they're also the backbone of the American economy. So it's a way of Russia um, and its its uh, allies conducting economic warfare against the United States. Maybe you've heard of BlackBob before. Just use their example to show you how I can get you know email addresses from uh, from their organization. But I don't know how many of you heard about the ransomware incident that occurred in 2020. Um, but this is a charge from the SEC that happened a little over a year ago, and it was because they were, you know, quote, less than thrilled to announce that they had got hit with ransomware. So I know BlackBot is, uh, you know, not a nonprofit, but they're obviously a software company and computing provider that services a lot of nonprofits. So, you know, by them suffering a ransomware attack, the outages uh, will uh, inevitably affect, you know, all of its clients and user base. And these gangs don't care, you know, who they serve or what their, uh, you know, primary mission is. Like all they're after is a payout. And if that doesn't drive home the point, then this will, right? And this is the last, you know, current event that I'm going to share with you. But here, the the non for profit Water for People was directly hit with ransomware um, not that long ago. So once again, these are seller people that are doing that are perpetuating this uh, ransomware and these types of, um, you know, criminal activities. So. I've been told by a lot of nonprofits um, throughout my career that they're they're not very concerned with ransomware because they don't have a lot of money um, and they have very little that someone could gain by launching such an attack against them. And I'm not going to argue that there are bigger payouts, right? That could be attained by breaching a larger for-profit company, but you got to understand that these groups are opportunistic and that they're looking for the quickest way to steal steal data and make money, even if it's a small sum comparatively. And that's because their tactics involve uh, scanning infrastructure on the internet for insecure and easy to exploit targets. And once they're discovered to automate the actual exploitation, which is you know, fairly easy to, to do for known, uh, known vulnerable software and then breach the perimeter, right? So they don't have to really do much. They already have everything set up. They just hit a few buttons and go. So <clears throat> you know, that's why there's such an emphasis here um, on ransomware. So I know we're at the top of the top of the hour already. So uh, I just want to 
drive home three uh, quick points. I know that was a lot of information, so I don't want anyone to go away or, or leave leave here confused today. But if I had to choose three broad yet different tactics, both for the individual and nonprofit, it would be the following. Implement multi-factor authentication. Confirm and maintain your organization's policies and procedures. And as an individual, always validate what someone is asking you to do. That's awesome. Thanks, Sam. That's a lot of information. I love the uh, the demo, even though uh, I am the victim or I, I would have been the <laughs> the guy that looked like uh, causing the victim, but uh, I like it um, and scary stuff uh, and good to know it's it's out there and how easy it is, right? That's, that's great. Um, so feel free to answer. I know we're at the top of the hour, so thank you everybody for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in Q&A. Uh, we do have one in here that I'll... Uh, ask you here uh is it safe to collect financial information via email like direct deposit authorizations even if they are deleted once received yes it's safe as long as there's a policy in place that um, dictates how long that information is kept and where that information is then moved to right so we need to be able to do our jobs and that's where the conversation around security can get really nuanced we don't want security to get in the way and prevent somebody from you know, uh, having a lot of friction and tedium in, in their in their actual responsibilities. Um, but we can't leave that type of information just floating around in our email inboxes for eternity. Good point. It's like writing it down on a piece of paper and leaving it on your desk, right? Well, thank you. That was really uh, interesting stuff. Uh, I took a bunch of notes. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And thanks, Sam, for the info. And if you have any other questions for him, um, definitely feel free to reach out. And uh, everybody have a great day. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, everyone.